having me and for showing up and being part of this uh, discussion, which is something that I think we're all sort of familiar with, that exercise is good for us, but that, you know, the more I remind myself about, the more I research, the more uh, surprised and amazed I am by how powerful exercise can be and uh, how much we actually know about the science of what happens in our brains. So let's talk about, uh, let's start by talking about two brothers. Oh, sorry, I'm just having, there we go. Two brothers, um, Jesse and Moriel. So Jesse's in the yellow and uh, Moriel's in the gray. And uh, they're both, you know, they're both very active young guys. Um, but in 2017, Jesse was biking home um, in California in the evening, and he was hit by a driver who went through a red light, and he fractured his spine, his clavicle, uh, his had nerve injury in his legs, and had a brain injury. And his brother got the phone call halfway across the world and, you know, just had shock and had to and immediately flew, flew across uh, to California to be with his brother. And they had, uh, they had trained in ultra marathon running together. So they had, they had been active. And while uh, Moriel was there supporting his brother and trying to uh, cope with uh, the emotions and the worry, and, and as well as his own issues, uh, he, he would go running in the areas uh, around the hospital and or, then around the rehab facility where his brother was recuperating. And uh, during these, these outings, during these long runs, he would have a series of encounters. So he explains in, this, in the article he wrote about this, that he had started running back in 2013 when, he, when Moriel himself was struggling with depression and anxiety. Um, and he had run a 38 mile ultra marathon, which left him significantly less um, or, yeah, depressed and moderately less anxious. He said, running has been my medication and meditation ever since. And that's something I'm going to talk to you about today, how exercise is um, a medication and meditation, good for the body and the mind. Um, on his first run, he saw something, he thought it was a snake, uh, turned out to be two snakes. And then upon, you know, the closer he got, he saw it was two rattlesnakes. And, and there was someone else there. He recorded it because he almost didn't believe it. It was like a magical experience. It was like he was hallucinating in the desert. And there was these two rattlesnakes mating. And you know, he felt this sort of brush with fear and, and with nature. And it made him feel scared, but also alive. And then another time he was running and he saw a creature running alongside in the distance with something in its mouth. And he thought it was like a dog, but the way it was moving seemed too graceful. Uh, to be to be a dog and it turned out someone else said no that's a mountain lion and uh, there again he had his brush with this wild nature on his runs while coping with his brother's illness and then finally literally a pack of coyotes confronted him and he he had these visions of being torn apart of being eaten of being chased by these guys and ran and ran and uh Got away and he asked his brother who was by now recovering and, and could speak and was becoming more like his, his old self and he said you know what do you think these experiences mean these these terrifying things that happen and jesse said well the world's a dangerous place then scary things happen um, but we need to keep doing the things we love um, despite despite that or maybe even because of that that's how we're going to cope with these difficulties in life um, and then moriel says you know maybe he and jesse can go running together again so to go from that beautiful natural image to a mechanical image of an escalator. And this is a, a metaphor that I read in an article about fentanyl uh, addiction, where he's, you know, the author said the, the world or our lives, it's like there's an escalator that's constantly bringing up new stressors. And each step has a different stressor. You know, it can be a problem at work, at home, finances, your personal health, your family's health global pandemic, the political situation, whatever it might be. And, you know, I talk about this with my patients a lot that, you know, something might trigger a relapse to anxiety or depression or to drug use. And we'll say, well, you know, we know what the trigger was. The trigger was that fight you had with your boyfriend or that, um, that you know, um, that problem you had at work or that diagnosis you got. 
Um, but we can't really stop those sorts of things from happening. We need to develop better skills to cope with the escalator. It's almost like the, like the video game. As, as things come up on the escalator, we have to learn how to knock them aside, how to absorb the blow or whatever the case might be. So there's an escalator of stress. Our jobs in life and, and the way to live a good life is to develop the skills to cope with that. And that's something, again, to go to these ideas of being out in nature and confronting danger. That's something that we've been doing for millions of years. And it hasn't um, been something that you know, we've coped with in the same ways we do now. Because before you would, you would you know, get chased by a mountain lion, you would run back to your encampment and that run back would have kind of gotten off that stress. And you're like, you know, that was pretty scary, but I feel good now because I survived. And there's some other reasons you feel good. And we'll talk about what's happening inside of your brain. You know, the thrill of running and hunting and just this eking out uh, existence in the natural world is something that brought us so much dopamine and norepinephrine and serotonin. We'll sh I'll show you some of the things that are happening. This is something that's fundamental to who we are. And you know, the things that allow us to survive, like food and reproduction, mating, they also give us pleasure. Uh, a lot of dopamine, it turns out, right? A lot of dopamine from food and from mating. And, and that's because um, we need to you know, want to keep doing these things to survive. Food in of itself is almost like an addictive drug. And we've seen that with sugar, right? I mean, the way sugar is everywhere. Once you start, you can't stop. You know, have you binged on sugar? Have you relapsed to sugar? Are you addicted to, to food? You know, it's certainly possible to have those experiences. And definitely with these drugs, which lead to even more ridiculous releases of dopamine in the brain. You know, like look at the graph of amphetamine or cocaine. It's unbelievably high. And, and people get addicted to that euphoria because everyone wants to feel good. Everyone wants dopamine and um, we'll keep doing whatever they need to do to get dopamine. But what I wanna show is that there's ways that are much more sustainable and, and can lead to long-term improvements because the problem with these drugs is that they lead to short burst and then to your brain getting overwhelmed, your receptors shutting down and then never being able to achieve those high levels. Again, people say they're chasing their first high the rest of their life. Whereas when you have the natural endorphins of exercise and friendship and love and um, the good things, then we don't have that problem. That leads to this idea, which is the chemistry of the runner's high, um, which is, is the exercise high, which seems to come from anandamide, which we, we uh, know now plays probably more of a role than the endorphins. We used to think it was the body's opiates. Now we seem to think it's more the body's cannabis system, right? So the runner's high, it's more like feeling calm. It's more like feeling um, stress, that stress has kind of left your body, your muscles are relaxed. That's more of like a cannabis feeling. And the, um, the reason we have cannabis receptors in our brain and throughout our body is actually because of this molecule. And the way we release this molecule is through physical activity and specifically through moderate physical activity, which means on a talk test, you can still talk, but you can't sing. So you're not just strolling gently, you're kind of jogging or whatever the equivalent would be. You can't sing because you're too short of breath, but you can still have a good discussion. That's moderate exercise when you get the most anandamide, the positive chemicals of exercise released. And uh, it turns out that anandamide in turn causes a, a brain hormone called BDNF that causes all sorts of good things in the brain. And I'm gonna show you that in a minute. So that's why I say that um, exercise is a medicine and that, you know, that, that has a lot of implications. We need to uh, understand what that means. We need to understand what it does to our bodies and our minds. And, and also how can we take advantage of it? Because everyone always says, says I'll take a pill but I don't have the time or the energy or the inclination. I'm not like Khaled who can just start running when, when uh, you know, the motivation takes me. And apparently Khaled told me that he started running. So that's really uh, difficult for a lot of people to do. And um, this is something that we all have experienced, right? 
And you know, this is what it looks like on the outside when someone is uh, anxious, upset, distressed, maybe tired. And on the inside, it feels even worse, right? There's, there's pain, there's muscle stiffness, there's the gastrointestinal distress, there's a fatigue, there's trouble concentrating, there's feelings of worthlessness or uh, of, of um, shame, guilt. These are all the negative emotions that we have to cope with. Remember that escalator that's always bringing us new stressors. So one of the worst ways to um, compound these negative emotions is to sleep badly. Because when you don't sleep well, everything else is much more challenging. And, and developing healthy sleep routine is something that you know, we, we have to work on. And if you look at the literature, lots of people say, oh, there's this, this epidemic of trouble sleeping. And again, we know that exercise is good for sleep, that uh, people who vigorously exercise have more of very good and fairly good sleep uh, compared to people at the bottom who have no activity, who have more very bad and fairly bad sleep. You can imagine how having a lot of very bad and fairly bad sleep will impact pretty much every other aspect in your life. And the same with sitting, the more sitting, which we're all doing right now, um, the more you do, the worse you sleep. The less you sit, the better you sleep. And paradoxically, the more you exercise, the more energy you have. And that's one of the many paradoxes in the exercises medicine world. Because you think that something like running after an antelope would make you sleepy in the afternoon but it doesn't seem to be the case. People have more energy. And you'd think that exercise, which kind of stresses the joints and the muscles would cause more arthritis or more uh, muscle problems. No, it's the opposite. There's less arthritis and less you know, muscle pain in people who exercise regularly and safely. Uh, and then inf inflammation, when you exercise, you're actually causing a lot of heat and releasing a lot of inflammatory markers in your body. Well, actually, the body adapts to that by sending out a whole bunch of anti-inflammatory systems, which ends up causing overall reduction in inflammation in your body. And so it's one of the many paradoxes that, you know, exercise does one thing, but then does the good thing even more, and it gives you more energy than it takes away. What about this problem? What about sadness and depression? which is something that's super common and a lot of people will experience over the course of their lives. And I've described some of the symptoms that you might feel. Can exercise treat this? Well, the challenge is how do you motivate someone who's suffering from low motivation to be active? And that's really hard. And I'll talk a little bit about that. But the thing is, if you can get to them before they get depressed, that's where the money is. And so you can actually prevent depression in the first place. And this has been shown in huge studies across the world that when people are more active as young people, a young adult throughout the course of their life, they're less likely to develop depression and anxiety. And I'll talk about anxiety in a second. So we can prevent depression through physical activity in schools and in day-to-day um, -day life. What about when someone develops depression, antidepressants versus exercise? where do we, you know, where do we make the decision? Well, in some regions, like in Australia and New Zealand, exercise is considered a first-line therapy before we use even counseling or antidepressants. So the idea is if somebody is struggling with mood and function, start, the people will say in the guidelines, start with exercise, improve sleep, reduce substance use, and then come back and we'll see how you're feeling. And if you're still feeling bad, then we'll talk about medications. I'll show you that a lot of the side effects on the body of exercise are positive, whereas you know, there are potential risks and side effects from antidepressants. And I mean, I prescribe them all the time, but I, I you know, want everyone to use all the tools available to them, including physical activity. Um, so you know, uh, uh, how do you do it? You start small, you start somewhere, and you try to you know, engage your social supports because we know that when you're feeling depressed, being active with other people is super motivating and also just helps you push even harder and keeps you on track. 
And the bottom thing uh, on the my um, whatever side that is it says don't wait is uh, don't wait until you feel like it, right? This concept of fake it until you make it, you know, it applies in a lot of aspects in life. If you don't feel happy, smile. Maybe it'll make you feel happy. If you don't feel like moving, start moving and you'll feel like moving. So, you know what, I'm just going to walk to Starbucks and get a coffee. And then once you're out walking, you know, it's a beautiful day. You might see a rattlesnake and all of a sudden you, um, you feel like maybe going a little bit further, pushing a little bit harder. Um, there's so many ways that uh, physical activity affects your brain and your, your genetics, even inside of cells. So uh, check it out on the, on the far side, telomere length. Telomere is kind of like the extra bit on the end of our DNA that gets shorter and shorter as we get older. Well, aerobic activity can increase telomere length, keep us healthier and, and age better. Epigenetic signaling is about how factors affect our DNA expression. It's better when you're active. I talked about sleep, that's circadian rhythm. I talked about dopamine and serotonin, that's the neurotransmitter function. And here's this term again that I mentioned briefly, brain-derived neurotrophic factor, BDNF. It, it causes brain cells to develop healthier, to develop more connections with each other, which in turn can improve things like concentration, memory, and cognition. It also causes stem cells to become healthy brain cells. So it actually grows the brain, which is what the next thing's about. I mentioned the antioxidants, inflammation, immune system. What about anger? I, I, see, I hear a lot of guys tell me about anger as a symptom that's pretty scary for you, know, you because you're angry and you feel a bit out of control. And that can lead to some serious problems with um, legal problems or relationship problems or just doing something that you regret. And it's also really scary for the person who's on the receiving end of the anger. And there's a lot of ways that we try to deal with that. But we know from a lot of evidence that, you know, if somebody has been physically active, their anger is going to be much more muted and possibly even disappear. So they've even done studies where they show people something that will enrage them, like photos that are supposed to upset them, and they'll show them before and after they exercise. And if they've exercised, they have a much less emotional response. And, you know, we just know that that's probably going to lead to better decision making when we're less emotional. Um, can exercise help treat anxiety? Yes. <laughs> um, so let me show you a bit about how. So one of the things I haven't mentioned is that engaging in exercise diverts you from what you're, what you're um, sort of ruminating on, right? Rumination is this obsession where we keep thinking about something over and over again. And when you engage in exercise, you become more mindful. You think about your environment, your, the moment you feel your body, you feel the heat, the sweat, all of those positive things, the breath coming in and out of your, uh, out of your lungs. Moving your body decreases muscle tension. Muscle tension is kind of like a, a negative cycle we get into. If you have muscle tension in your neck and your back from you know, being stressed, uh, you start thinking about it, it makes you feel worse. You feel more muscle tension. It's just kind of moves in on itself. Whereas when you warm up the muscles and stretch the muscles through activity, that feels better. You, you don't think about it. You end up in a better place in your mind. Uh, one of the other, so here we see again, the so, same hormones I mentioned, uh, brain derived neurotrophic factor and uh, endocannabinoids, which is anandamide, as well as another one here, which is GABA, also involved in anxiety and calm, calm feelings and our emotional responses. The frontal part of the brain is where we make our good decisions. Exercise activates that, that logical frontal part of the brain. And then the last one, I'm kind of blocking a little bit, but exercise regularly, exercising regularly builds up resources that bolster resilience against stormy emotions. Um, and this is the thing about doing something really hard. And you, you've all, we've all had this experience. Doing something really hard makes us feel a little bit badass. And it makes us feel a little bit more confident when we face other threats or challenges in our life. I mean, this guy who runs you know, a 34 mile ultra marathon in the desert, you know, it kind of makes you feel like you can cope with stuff when you've accomplished something like that. And if you do a, a Peloton camp where they kind of tell you you're awesome or, or a spin class or a boot camp where they say, you know, this is hard and you're awesome, 
you do feel pretty, pretty good about yourself. And that's the point, right? We want people to feel good and powerful and capable. And this is something that we've learned in the pandemic that you know, we can find new ways of being active and use activity. We've been very limited in what we can do, but fortunately, if you live somewhere where there is some nature or where there is some safe outdoor space to move, you can do that and you can do it indoors. And I'm gonna show you some, some simple ways we can do that. So, you know, um, you know this is something that we, we can take away and we, we already knew it, but the more you learn about it, the, the more impressive it is. What about in substance use? Uh, and this is interesting because, uh, you know, I showed you how uh, methamphetamine and cocaine and opiates cause dopamine release. And we're also trying to make people high with exercise. So does that make sense? Uh, can you get addicted to, to one or the other? Some people who've had serious substance problems have used exercise to cope with those, those experiences. So Lionel Sanders is from, um, from Ontario. And he uh, you know, grew up always feeling very hard and bad about himself. He didn't feel comfortable unless he was on some sort of drinking uh, drug or drinking, and he was in a really dark place. And in 2009, he was in Windsor and he went into his garage and very, came very close to committing suicide. Um, but something that day changed his mind and he decided to, to try a different way to, to change his mind and his body through training for uh, exercise. And that's what he did. He trained for the Ironman triathlons. And over the next few years, built himself up into um, the world champion. Um, in 2016, he was the world champion, and he's won, um, you know, half marathon, half Ironman, 27 times, for uh, four Ironman wins. He, 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 you know, people say that he has this incredible ability to cope with pain. When other people would sort of stop and say, you know, what I've had enough. He, he'll say, you know what, I've been through worse than this and I can keep going. So this is pretty amazing what, what somebody who's been through a really hard time with mental health can then do um, in this domain. And Katra Corbett said she also was reborn on the run and she had substance use and was in jail for selling methamphetamine, I think in California. And that's when she realized she had to change. Now she runs hundred miles in races, you know, a month, every month or two. So, um, you know, it's not necessary that um, everyone becomes so extreme in what they accomplish, but it is inspiring. And it does show the principle that, that if you have had a history of using these very powerful substances in your brain, you can find healthy and sustainable ways to change your brain and improve your health and feel high in a good way uh, through activity. Scott Douglas is a very impressive writer and editor uh, and runner. And he's written this book, which uh, again, I, I th thought I knew everything about this field, but again, very impressed by his uh, exploration of running uh, as, a, as an improvement to your mental health and tells his own story about struggling with alcoholism alcohol use disorder and all the negative feelings, you know, all this, I, you know, you, you, you hear this a lot in this field, the shame and the guilt, feeling disgusted with himself and all the mental energy he was uh, spending drinking and even more lying and disappointing his wife. So he, you know, he tells his story and it's not simple. It's not that just you go and you run a 5k and all of a sudden you've stopped drinking. You, know, you have to want it and you have to work at it. Um, but that's something that I think we all know in, in general in life. And Scott's story is uh, full of uh, insights that we can all take away. I've been sharing this uh, AA website with people for many years. And only uh, when I was preparing this presentation did I think, isn't it interesting that they've chosen to use a snowboarder as the main photo on the, on the website? So the idea that when people are struggling with alcohol, that um, being out in nature, being active is just something that we can latch onto and say, you know what, I want that because that I know is gonna feel good, even though it may be a little bit dangerous to snowboard that, like that if you don't know what you're doing. Um, in Boston, 
Um, Mike uh, Ferrello started a group, a, a running club for people who are in uh, recovery from substance use disorders. You know, just such an inspiring uh, program, something I think every city should have, and we should have one in Ottawa as well. Um, but like we mentioned at the beginning, you know, how do you go from I can not do something to I can and I will and I'm going to do it? And that's the challenge in a lot of life and a lot of medicine, motivational interviewing, motivating yourself, um, using cognitive tricks, gamifying things. That's what we do a lot nowadays. We gamify stuff to make it fun. Um, we try to get kids to play games where they're learning math, even if they didn't realize it. Um, how to start exercising when you really don't want to. Uh, I'll talk about I'll talk about the challenges. So obviously, I mentioned at the beginning, you know, you can go on a walk to Starbucks. Uh, walking is a great way to get started, and it engages a lot of the muscles. You can use a pedometer, you can use your phone. 30 minutes is 4,000 steps. What about apps? What about uh, YouTube? What about you know, online groups, um, I, 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 there's so much out there. That can be challenging because then it can be like, well, what do I use? You know, you can use something that's free because there's tons of good free stuff. And then you can just try different things and see what works for you. How do you fit it into your life? You know, if you, if you find yourself saying, I don't have time for it, you really need to look at how you're using your time. And again, think about the relative risks and payoff and benefits of, of using exercise and incorporating it into your life. What are you doing that you could maybe do less of in order to, to be active? Uh, when we used to commute to the office more, that's a great time. At lunch is a great time, after work. And if you can't do it on the weekdays, the studies show that if you just do it on the weekend, that's still very beneficial. If you have less time, you know, sometimes I'll only have 20 minutes. I'll go fast for 20 minutes and then I'll get back to work. Um, being with a, a friend when and where permitted, very motivating. Being at home, there's lots of ways to do it using the apps I showed you. And of course, it's great if you can pay for a, a trainer, if you have a buddy who's a trainer. I mean, there's really few things that are as motivating than having someone who's focused all on you and you getting better and being the best, fittest person you can be. It, it, it can be expensive and it's not something we can do uh, right at this very moment in history. What about the idea that um, you have to suffer to, to progress. I don't know. I mean, pain is, perhaps it is weakness leaving the body, but um, pain is not something that we all go after. Although pain can be experienced in different ways, right? If you have a, an injection, but you're getting a, a great vaccine that's gonna protect you against something, you feel, okay, that's good pain. If you, um, if you have a, you know, a dental procedure and you just hate every minute of it, that's not such great pain. Uh, if you hurt yourself, that's not good pain. But if you do a hard workout and you feel sore and you, know, you kind of have a hard time walking up the stairs afterwards, but you know it's because you really pushed yourself, then you might feel differently about that kind of pain. What you don't want is to feel negatively. I'm very much a believer, and I think this is borne out in, in life, by, about Pavlovian conditioning, right? The idea that you can be conditioned into hating something quite easily. If someone gave you an electric shock every time you ate you know, a, a bagel, you'd probably stop eating bagels pretty quick. And if every time you work out, you feel horrible, you're not gonna want to um, keep doing that. Unfortunately, the time you feel worse is kind of like the first four months after you start training. And that's why there's a lot of dropouts. A lot of people who drop out and say, you know what, that wasn't for me. I guess I, guess I was the one who you know, doesn't work for me because I hurt too much. I say, no, 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 that's actually normal. It's normal to suffer a bit in the beginning. You gotta push through that. I used to have a lot of you know, sort of uh, pain and suffering when I first started ramping up my running. And I just sort of, I, I, you know, it, it, was, it was hard. And you just have to keep pushing through. Um, I, I used to do a, a swimming program with this really cool coach here, and I had never done swimming before. And we would do laps, and she was an Olympian and very motivating. And, and one day I came back from a trip to Europe, and I went to the pool, and I didn't skip my workout that day. I said, you know, I'm going to be really great. I'm going to, you know, do my, my workout. And at the end of it, I felt really horrible and cold. 
and tired. And I never, ever went back to that swimming program. <laughs> and that's the thing, like if you force yourself and make yourself miserable, the, sometimes it doesn't, it, that's not the right, not the right decision. So that's something you need to find the balance and reward yourself and make it positive. Don't make yourself hate it. So when you start from zero, start slow, uh, start low and go slow, right? Um, for the first five weeks, you can go like 12 minutes, three times a week, um, low intensity, like super gentle. It depends on what your activity level is. Then you want to go a bit more, a bit, a bit longer, a bit more frequent, a little more intense. Take it easy. Then you want to get to your maintenance stage. It's not like you need to keep ramping it up forever. You're going to get to a maintenance stage where you feel like this is the right level for me. Personally, I mean, I could always run more and more ultra marathon distances further and further. Uh, but that just hasn't been the decision I've made yet because I don't think it's sustainable and I think it would I, I could get injured and I don't have the time for it. So those aren't my personal goals right now, but that, that might be the goal for somebody who has more time or is younger. Um, at the beginning, you know, if you, uh, you increase it, the intensity slowly, you don't want to get hurt because if you get hurt, you're completely sidelined and then you're back to square one. If you overdo it, you can pull back a little rest and then try again. And then of course, you know, you got to check, um, make sure that you're healthy enough to do these things, especially if you have chronic health conditions, if you get chest pain, short of breath, if you have palpitations, and if you sort of feel like one day you wake up and you really can't do what you could do in the past, that means you may have had this drop in your ability to exercise. That's kind of a symptom of overtraining, overtraining syndrome. And, and you know, we need to be careful with these sorts of things and uh, be safe because we wanna be able to do this in the long run. There's no age at which it's too late to exercise, but you know, you know a lot of people, a lot of guys who were like sports stars when they were young, and then they just kind of stopped doing it after high school or after university. And this, they're not getting any of the benefit. I mean, it's great, they were active, they were in good shape when they were 20, but that doesn't help them now that they're 40 or, or they're older. Um, you know, I really am a big believer in the, in the outdoors, um, but um, we have to be careful about heat and humidity. Um, we have to be careful about cold weather. I personally think cold weather is one of the best times to train because, you know, you don't get overheated. You know, the snow is really nice to uh, run on. It's gentle on your joints. Uh, you have the right gear. There's no reason to suffer skiing and all that's great. The hot days, you have to make do, uh, find the right time and, and be careful. What about strength training? So, you know, it's easy to talk about running and cardio and, and we know that that's great. Turns out strength training is really important too. And we have this problem with the body. In fact, there's quite a few problems with the way the body is designed. Um, and it's not kind to old people, okay? Um, you know, as we age, after age 35, we lose muscle mass every single year, which is why you know um, you see a 25 year old guy and a 65 year old, the way their muscle hangs, the way their body is shaped is different. And unfortunately that muscle becomes fat and that has other implications. So um, that can lead to weakness. You can have trouble getting out of the chair. You can have trouble going upstairs and, and we have to counteract that. And strength training can do that and muscle also actually has this incredible power. It sends out these things called myokines, which are muscle signals to the whole body. And it's kind of like, look, I'm really important. You need me to hunt and to walk and to go upstairs, make more of me. And I'm gonna suck up the blood sugar from your body. Uh, I'm gonna keep you strong. I'm gonna reduce the stress on your joints, prevent back pain, reduce back pain. And so muscle actually is sort of neglected sometimes when we think about this fitness stuff do your strength training. Sounds intimidating, right? It sounds like I'm gonna make you do weights, but I'm not. You can do a lot of strength training at home. And you know, the squat is one of the best exercises. They say, uh, one of my uh, friends who's a, a runner and a writer went to Japan and he found that uh, people are squatting to get onto the floor to eat or to use squat toilets. They're so strong because they're just squatting all the time in their day-to-day -day life. And we often don't have occasion to squat. But if you're in your office, you, you know, you've got a few minutes, you do 10 squats, bang, you've just done a muscle workout. 
uh, and you're a lot stronger for it. Um, but what about the dreaded push-up? Upper body, amazing. Uh, lots of muscles are being engaged. You don't need to buy any weights or any equipment to do, do these things. A lot of people complain of back pain and neck pain. The plank keeps you strong, keeps, you know, you engage your core in all of these exercises and it reminds you of how important that core is. You know, the lunge is more of the, of the legs, but you're engaging your core as well. All of those things you can do, you can put them together in this really cool uh, exercise, the seven minute workout, seven minutes. You know, I've read somewhere that you, you get as much exercise as 30 minutes of gentle stuff. I'm not sure about that, but this is high intensity interval training in seven minutes, or let's say you do twice, 14 minutes, you get a really good workout and you're doing some stuff that you recognize like a jumping jack and a push up that I showed you a squat, a plank, a lunge, a little bit of knee jogging, high knee jogging. Some of this stuff might be too difficult for a lot of people to do but it's it, um, something you can work up to or you could substitute one of the activities. There's apps, there's YouTube videos, there's all kinds of ways you can find seven minute workout. Uh, people really like it. So just some ideas of how we can start. Let's say we've got, we're sedentary, we've got nothing. Then we do, like I showed you three days a week, 12 to 20 to 30 minutes and do some walking. Remember that moderate activity is when you're too winded to sing, but not so winded they can't talk. I love this because it's subjective and it's dynamic. As you get more fit, you'll be able to do something more intense. You could run up a hill and you could still be talking. Whereas at the beginning, you might be running, you know, walking up the stairs and you can't talk. And, and who's had that experience of you know, going up a couple of flights of stairs and being like, wow, I didn't realize how hard that was. I must, be, uh, I must have lost some fitness. I must be less fit than I thought. Um, then if somebody is a little more um, sedentary or a little more active to start, they can do some walking. And then look, one set of body squats times 10 and one plank for 30 seconds. We're not asking the moon. You don't need to be really intense. You don't need to run an ultra marathon. Um, but if you are a little more active, you can do some running, jogging, and you can do two sets each of body squats, planks, push-ups, pull-ups. Again, it might take you only 10 minutes to do the strength training and you know, 20 minutes of jogging. That's gonna be a, a real gift to your body and your mind. Um, just some of the side effects of, of exercise. So first of all, the blue guys on, on this picture are high fitness. The red is low fitness. The blue guys um, have less days of viral illness per, per 12 weeks in the study back when people weren't social distancing and they had fewer symptoms and less sim severe symptoms. So being more physically active um, makes, protects you, it boosts your immune system and it allows your immune system to recover more quickly. What else does it do? It lowers the risk of stroke, lowers the risk of diabetes, lowers high blood pressure, lowers the risk of multiple cancers, including breast cancer, colon cancer, dementia, Dementia is a lot of, of a vascular disease. It's because of blockages in the um, arteries in the brain and exercise cleans out those arteries, improves blood flow to the brain, reduces the risk of dementia and other cognitive things, helps us recover from depression and brain injuries even. And so that's where we're gonna um, leave things before we do some questions or get, get to conversation. I don't know how much of this is new to you or how motivating it is, whether it's intimidating. I, I think it's, it should be inspiring to be out in a beautiful setting like this with water and the sunset and being active. And that's what our bodies were meant to do. And you know, I'd love to chat more if anyone has any thoughts or questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Raman. That was very interesting and important. And I guess I will have to start squatting uh, more. <laughs> Uh, we have three questions in the chat, and then I have another question anonymous that I didn't um, write yet. So the first question is, um, I used to run with the group. Now I find it a bit hard to motivate myself running solo. Any tips? 
Well, um, I guess that's a pandemic problem, right? Not being able to run with the group. Um, and that's the responsible thing to do. Running solo, I mean, it depends. Some people really find it boring <laughs> to be alone with your thoughts. And, and that can be an issue. Um, of course, the, some of the solutions there are to have music, um, to have podcasts or audiobooks. Personally, I'm obsessed with listening to audiobooks when I run and um, to use an app because apps, when they track you, they track your speed and your distance and then you give you feedback. You know, on Nike, it even has you done, do training runs. Nike also has this incredible thing on, on the Nike Run Club, again, free app, which is um, it's called like a, a company runs or, or something like that. And basically you can, you go on a run and it's, you choose the distance and you choose who you're running with. So you can run with like these guys who are Olympians or Iliad Kipchoge, who is the marathon, the world marathon champion. And for that, like there's an hour run with him and he's talking to the coach and he's giving you feedback and you're hearing his running story. I don't know, maybe it's just me, but I find that incredibly inspiring. And they have about 20 or 30 of these different um, runs where you feel like you're running with some of these uh, incredible athletes. And, uh, you know, it, it, they kind of push you on. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Raman. And the next question is, uh, what advice do you have for someone who takes a lot of medication and wants to start running, but whose energy is um, either high or too low? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That goes to sort of the comments I made about safety. Medication can have a lot of different effects. A lot of medications can affect our kidney function and our electrolyte balance, like sodium and potassium. And, and that can increase the risk of dehydration and the consequences of dehydration. Um, so that's an important thing to check, especially in the hot weather. You know, uh, make sure that you have some capacity, make sure that your medications are not too close to the edge of what your body can tolerate. So that'd be a discussion to have with a healthcare provider, uh, as well as experience, because you know, you know what you've experienced. Um, the problem with the energy being high or low, um, and that's sort of like, like the circadian rhythm problem when you kind of sleep too much or you can't sleep or you're sleeping at the wrong time. Those are things that can get smoothed out and can be improved through having a regular exercise routine or by making it a habit, you know, kind of like um, it's not something it's like you, you don't think about brushing your teeth, you just do it. If you say every morning I do my 30 minute walk with my dog or my 30 minute run or whatever, that sort of takes away the dis decision making. Uh, and, and it's kind of like, like Scott Douglas, who was struggling with alcohol use, you know, for a while there, he, he sort of said to himself, I'm just going to try to drink as little as possible. And he ended up spending so many hours thinking, should I drink today? Should I not drink? How much should I drink? Did I drink too much? Whereas if you just make the decision, take the decision away and say, I'm not going to drink, or rather I'm going to exercise 30 minutes, three times a week. I'm not going to think about it. That sort of can keep you more um, on track. Thank you, Dr. Raman. Um, next question. Could regular physical activities help us if you want to reduce our consumption? Consumption of drugs and alcohol? Um, it what you think? wasn't mentioned, I can. Yeah, exactly. So again, this has been studied a lot and I write about it in, um, in my book a little bit. Um, and and, and it's, it's interesting. Um, for example, if you look at what happened in Iceland. I don't know if you know about this experience they had, but in the 90s, Iceland, which is a small place, there's only like, I don't know, a few hundred thousand people. They have the highest rate of teen drinking and they have very high rates of teen smoking and cannabis use. And they sort of got their public health people together and said, what can we do? What, what factors are you know, motivating people to do this? And they said, well, you know, you know what would be protective if we do the things that we know protect adolescents. And that means A, physical activity, B, keeping kids busy and motivated, C, spending quality time with their parents. 
uh, and preventing them from hanging out in groups on their own too much, right? So they actually instituted these things. So they, they, may, they subsidized and made activities after school um, very, uh, so pretty much universal. They, um, they created a lot of um, art, art and drama programs and um, they uh, encouraged parents to spend time with their kids. And they actually set in these little curfews for teenagers that they couldn't be out in the park after you know, 10 p.m. or midnight, depending on how old they were. And from the 90s until the you know, teens, the 2010s, they got substance use down hugely. Like they went from being the worst in Europe to one of the best. And it seems to be some sort of uh, consequence of this program that they had. And, you know, you know, Iceland went on in the World Cup and they beat England. I mean, how does a tiny country like that have such good soccer players? Well, it's because all these kids are doing sports, uh, whereas before they were hanging out in groups and using substances. So, yeah, I, I think there's lots of evidence from different drugs, cannabis, stimulants, alcohol, that uh, we can reduce consumption through physical activity. Thank you, Dr. Ali. And... Anasti, any other question? I have one question. Um, I was wondering how often should we drink water when we start running? Um, yeah, no, hydration is really important, right? And, and, and there's been a lot of discussion about that and also what to hydrate with. Yeah. It, it'll depend on a lot of factors like how hot it is outside. I, I think at the beginning, you're going to sweat more because your body's gonna be working harder um, to do that. Um, and sweating is this incredible thing. Um, one of my friends has written a book about sweat that's coming out soon. And, and it's really what allowed humans to be so good at exercising because other animals can't sweat like us, us and so they can't sustain physical activity like running uh, for as long as we can. So they'll actually drop dead of heat exhaustion during hot days and we can keep running and lose like 10 or 15 percent of our body weight uh, sweating it out during a during a marathon or an ultra marathon um, so the, the 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 metric to use is probably how thirsty you are and and it's like so many things i i'm not really a big quantifier i don't always believe in like you know using the heart rate monitor or measuring our pee or whatever people do but just uh, feeling your body, how, how much are you uh, struggling to breathe? Use that as your aerobic fitness test. How thirsty are you? Use that to guide your fluid intake. And again, that's been studied and it's actually as accurate or more accurate than other types of things where you like force yourself to drink periodically. And forcing yourself to consume more fluids than you need might lead to more gastrointestinal distress. Once you start doing more complicated, long workouts and you're like running an Ironman or, or an ultra or a marathon, then you kind of want to stay ahead of your fluid intake. And you're actually starting to eat as well during those long workouts, which is hard to imagine, but you can train your body to eat during long workouts as well. So um, I, there's this idea that, you know, you have to drink two liters yeah. of fluid a day or something. There's no magic number. Uh, we probably drink too much fluid in general in our society, if you think about how much water we would have had in the past, we wouldn't have had as much as we do now. Uh, it probably makes our kidneys work a little harder than they need to. Um, but if you're thirsty, you drink, and and, and water is probably the best thing to do uh, to drink. You know, these electrolyte fluids, you know, not always necessary. And there's all. Then I, I write about it a little bit of talk about well, what about chocolate milk? It has like this perfect carbohydrate and sugar and protein ratio, it can be good after a workout, but uh, listen to your body. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Amin. Uh, I know you have a book that will be available soon. Um, would you like to tell us more about the book? Well, I think I just did. I think that um, what, uh, you know, I mentioned and, and it's, it, you know, what I think the thing uh, is that it can be, you can get a loss and it can be a little dry, all the science. So what I really tried to do was to tell personal stories, of my, my own and others, as well as stories from the history of sports uh, and running, which is really, uh, again, trying to motivate us and inspire us. 
you know, I used to like, let's say I listened to a book about running, I'd go out and have a, a workout, you know, twice as good as, as on another day. Uh, personally, I find it very motivating. And it's kind of like running with a group, you know, when other people are involved, or when you're hearing other stories, it just pushes you to go that little bit extra. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Allen. Uh, I see no other questions. So I think um, we are good for this presentation. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Amin. This presentation will be available on YouTube. Um, and I can't wait to um, read the book. It will be available in August. August. Mm -hmm. August. Yeah. That sounds good. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. And uh, have a great day. Thank you so much. All the best.